From Barrio Boy by Ernesto Galarza. Ernesto Galarza was born in 1905 in the Mexican town of Tecolcoltan. The Mexican Revolution of 1910 compelled his family to immigrate to the United States, where they eventually settled in Sacramento, California. Like many other immigrants, they worked on the farms in the area. Encouraged by one of his teachers, Galarza went on to attend college and in time received a doctoral degree from Columbia University. Galarza became a historian, a professor, and a champion for the rights of farm workers and other laborers. He told the story of his early years in Barrio Boy, first published in 1971. Galarza died in 1984. My mother and I walked south on 5th Street one morning to the corner of Q Street and turned right. Half of the block was occupied by the Lincoln School. It was a three-story wooden building with two wings that gave it the shape of a double T connected by a central hall. It was a new building, painted yellow, with a shingled roof that was not like the red tiles of the school of Mazlatan. I noticed other differences, none of them very reassuring. We walked up the wide staircase hand in hand and through the door, which closed by itself. A mechanical contraption screwed to the top shut it behind us quietly. Up to this point, the adventure of enrolling me in the school had been carefully rehearsed. Mrs. Dotson had told us how to find it and we had circled it several times on our walk. Friends in the barrio explained that the director was called a principal and that it was a lady and not a man. They assured us that there was always a person at the school who could speak Spanish. Exactly as we'd been told, there was a sign on the door in both Spanish and English, principal. We crossed the hall and entered the office of Miss Nettie Hopley. Miss Hopley was at a roll top desk to one side, sitting in a swivel chair that moved on wheels. There was a sofa against the opposite wall, flanked by two windows and a door that opened on a small balcony. Chairs were set around a table and framed pictures hung on the walls of a man with long white hair and another with a sad face and a black beard. The principal half turned in the swivel chair to look at us over the pinch glasses crossed on the ridge of her nose. To do this, she had to duck her head slightly as if she were about to step through a low doorway. What Miss Hopley said to us, we did not know, but we saw in her eyes a warm welcome. And when she took off her glasses and straightened up, she smiled wholeheartedly like Mrs. Dotson. We were, of course, saying nothing, only catching the friendliness of her voice and the sparkle in her eyes while she said the words we did not understand. She signaled us to the table. Almost tiptoeing across the office, I maneuvered myself to keep my mother between me and the gringo lady. In a matter of seconds, I had to decide whether she was a possible friend or a menace. We sat down. Then Miss Hopley did a formidable thing. She stood up. Had she been standing when we entered, she would have seemed tall. But rising from her, her chair, she soared. And what she carried up in, with her was a buxom superstructure. Firm shoulders, a straight sharp nose, full cheeks, slightly molded by a curved line along the nostrils, thin lips that moved like steel springs, and a high forehead topped by hair gathered in a bun. Miss Hopley was not a giant in body, but when she mobilized it to a standing position, she seemed a match for giants. I decided I liked her. She strode to the door in the far corner of the office, opened it, and called a name. A boy of about 10 years appeared in the doorway. He sat down at one end of the table. He was brown like us, a plump kid with shiny black hair, combed straight back, neat, cool, and faintly obnoxious. Miss Hopley joined us with a large book and some papers in her hand. She too sat down and the questions and answers began by way of our interpreter. My name was Ernesto. My mother's name was Henrietta. My birth certificate was in San Blas. Here was my last report card from the Escuela Municipal Numero para Verones of Matlatan and so forth. Miss Hopley put things down in the book and my mother signed a card. As long as the questions continued, Doña Henriqueta could stay and I was secure. 
Now that they were over, Miss Hopley saw her to the door, dismissed our interpreter, and without further ado, took me by the hand and strode down the hall to Miss Ryan's first grade. Miss Ryan took me to a seat at the front of the room, into which I shrank the better to survey her. She was too skinny, somewhat runty, me, of a withering height when she patrolled the class. And when I least expected it, there she was, crouching by my desk, her blonde, radiant face level with mine, her voice patiently maneuvering me over the awful idiosities of the English language. During the next few weeks, Miss Ryan overcame my fears of tall, energetic teachers as she bent over my desk to help me with a word in the pre-primer. Step by step, she loosened me and my classmates from the safe anchorage of the desk for recitations at the blackboard and consultations at her desk. Frequently, she burst into happy announcements to the whole class. Ito can read a sentence. And small Japanese Ito, squint-eyed and shy, slowly read aloud while the class listened in wonder. Come, Skipper, come. Come and run. The Korean, Portuguese, Indian, and Polish first graders had similar moments of glory, no less shining than mine the day I conquered Butterfly which I had been persistently pronouncing in standard Spanish as butterfly. Children, Miss Ryan called for attention. Ernesto has learned how to pronounce butterfly, and I proved it with a perfect imitation of Miss Ryan. From that celebrated success, I was soon able to match Ido's progress as a sentence reader with, come butterfly, come fly with me. Like Ido and several other first graders who did not know English, I received private lessons from Miss Ryan in a closet, a narrow hall off of the classroom with a door at each end. Next to one of these doors, Miss Ryan placed a large chair for herself and a small one for me. Keeping an eye on the class through the open door, she read with me about sheep in the meadow and a frightened chicken going to see the king, coaching me out of my phonetic runs in words like pasture, bow wow wow, Hey, and pretty, which to my Mexican ear and eye had so many unnecessary sounds and letters. She made me watch her lips and then close my eyes as she repeated words I found hard to read. When we came to know each other better, I tried to interrupt me to tell Miss Ryan how we said it in Spanish. It didn't work. She only said, oh, and went on with pasture, bow wow wow, and pretty. It was as in that closet, we were both discovering together the secrets of the English language and grieving together over the tragedies of Bo Peep. The main reason I was graduated with honors from the first grade was that I had fallen in love with Miss Ryan. Her radiant, no-nonsense character made us either afraid not to love her or love her so we would not be afraid. I am not sure which. It was not only that we sensed she was with it, but also that she was with us. Like the first grade, the rest of Lincoln School was a sampling of the lower powder of town where many races made their home. My pals in the second grade were Kazushi, whose parents spoke only Japanese, Maddie, a skinny Italian boy, and Manuel, a fat Portuguese who would never get into a fight but wrestled you to the ground and just sat on you. Our assortment of nationalities included Koreans, Yugoslavs, Poles, Irish, and homegrown Americans. At Lincoln, making us into Americans did not mean scrubbing away what made us originally foreign. The teachers called us as our parents did, or as close as they could pronounce our names in Spanish or Japanese. No one was ever scolded or punished for speaking his native tongue on the playground. Maddie told the class about his mother's down quilt, which she had made in Italy, with the fine feathers of a thousand geese. Encarnacion acted out how the boys learned to fish in the Philippines. I astounded the third grade with the story of my travels on a stagecoach, which nobody else in the class had seen except in the museum at Sutter's Fort. After a visit to the Crocker Art Gallery and its collection of heroic paintings of the Golden Age of California, someone showed, showed a silk scroll with a Chinese painting. Miss Hopley herself had a way of expressing wonder over these matters before a class, her eyes wide open until they popped slightly. 
It was easy for me to feel that becoming a proud American, as she said we should, did not mean feeling ashamed of being a Mexican.